Let me take you back to a particular weekend in 1996. I was a, a young teacher, and I had 28 hours of classes looking ahead of me um, a, a week, and I was preparing the next chapter because I was just ru running one chapter ahead of my classes. And I had four classes, third graders, and the next chapter um, had an interesting subject called urban planning. Uh, and it contained uh, plans and procedures and laws, six le lessons on stretch. And the more I prepared and the more I read it, the angrier I became. I could not do this because it was plain boring. <laughs> I could not envision, I tried a preja vu of my 14 year old sitting in the classroom and me telling them excitingly about the way the local council was dealing with urban planning. <laughs> I refused. I blocked. I was a racing horse in front of a blockade. I could not jump. I had to do something. First of all, I, I asked myself a question. And this question was, why? Yeah? So why are we putting this in a book? Why am I putting it in front of these kids? And I think you all know the famous escape every teacher uses, which is a sentence that starts with suppose. <laughs> and those who teach might recognize the suppose. Suppose you're 45 and your neighbor has this idea of starting a vicious chip shop. I bet you it is nice to know that you can object to it. And in the book it says all oh, how you can do that. Yes, and by the age of 45, they will clearly remember what's in the book. <laughs> so what is the underlying flaw? Because somebody that was very learn, learned and, and intelligent had put it in the book. We provide answers to questions they never ask, all the time. And I thought, at least if they don't have a question, I cannot provide answers, especially not on urban planning. So what I did, in anger, that weekend, I created a silly playing board game, paper-based, for four players and a mayor. And the four players were community council members. One was responsible for housing, one was responsible for industry, one was responsible for ecology, and together they had each had an individual assignment to create a number of houses, a number of industry placements, a number of green areas in the neighborhood. And they started sort of cutting out paper and putting it down and saying, OK, well, that's better than listening to him. And the mayors came to me afterwards and said, it was not fun, we had nothing to do. I said, well, your time will come, because the next lesson, one smart kid raised his finger and said, it doesn't fit. <laughs> Stupid me. I do apologize for the inconvenience. Please make it happen anyway. And all hell broke loose. <laughs> and my headmaster was walking through the corridor looking inside and thought, oh my god, there's one of these young dogs not having full control. <laughs> but it was a self-contained drama, because every mayor was, blessed, was sort of taking care of the small fires. And ever from that point onwards, I could just stand in the windowsill with a little cup of coffee, watching 24 hours on end, having pupils doing their stuff without me interfering. Even stronger, they came back for it in between hours if they had nothing to do. Can we please work on the project? After school they come back, can we work on the project? You won't believe me, would you? <laughs> we are talking about teaching and learning, right? They came back for it. So, what kind of secret button had I pressed? I had no idea. It was born from anger, and it took me till 2005 to go to a conference in San Francisco, which was called the Games Developers Conference, where all these nerds and shirts were talking about game design, and all of a sudden, everything I tried and attempted and experimented with and was rebuked about by colleagues from academia because I failed to support my designs and my advices as an educational advisor from scientific sources. So where did you got it from? I couldn't answer, say, God or inspiration. That was not scientific. But here, in this sector, there was the key. That was the clue. 
That was why it was happening. They had the language, the models, the theory, the practice, and it all made sense. It was a week, a trip of a week, and it changed my life, as that weekend in 1996 did. It made me realize that I grew up in an environment of lean-back media. When I got home from school, and you could put on the television, whoa, television, um, it is sender-receiver-based. I receive something somebody has created. And that world I was in was completely dominated by sender-receiver paradigms. It was the stage of development we were in, and media was sender-receiver-based. Until in 1982, I got my first home computer. Um, well, it was a computer, but if you switch it on, you had a black screen and a white cursor. And it was sort of looking at me, and now what? And I had to tell it what to do. But that changed an awful lot of stuff, didn't it? The advent of computers. Why? Well, not just so much because it was technology. It introduced a new paradigm, which is called interactivity. These media do not perform their stuff if you don't do something yourself. You have to act. You have to do stuff. Games are about doing stuff. If I put down the game controller, nothing happens. Look. So if I push the button, something happens. What happens is that by doing stuff and getting response from a system, you build up a notion of what we call interactivity. And what I'd like to postulate today is that interactivity is not uh, directly connected to technology only. It is a language. It is a language in your head that you can develop and recognize and learn to speak and to understand. And if I start a new game, and play it with my son, who's now 13 year, 14 years old, and we start together at the same time, then within 20 minutes, he will have reached 20, level 28, and I will have reached level 5. And um, I have done more than 10,000 hours supposed to be necessary to become an expert. <laughs> so he is better in that language. His language has developed better than mine, and I've been playing ever since 1982, on any platform I could my hand, get my hands on. So let's face it, yes, we are in a generation gap. A massive one. And one very stealthily developed. So on the one hand, we've got a generation where technology came into their lives somewhere when they were in offices with these blue screens of death, these wonderful letters from Bill Gates telling you that you lost just everything you had and that it cannot be recovered, but then written in strange signs. How can you trust technology if that is when it first came into your life? The platforms, the technologies my kids use now are robust as hell. They are on this side. They're four years old, now on the couch with an iPad. That is their entry level in technology. That is the first they encounter. I gave my daughter the Sony Ericsson from a year before when the iPhone came in and said, look, it was very hip and trendy. She got to the town, got back, threw it on the table, said, whoever invented this one? <laughs> you can't use it. It's got menus. <laughs> Four layers deep. It's insane. I do apologize for the inconvenience. I got her a Samsung. Um, but this is a generation gap of epic proportions. Because everybody on this side is making the decisions, writing the textbooks, shelling out uh, investments, making up plans in the government. They're all here. So who is crossing that gap? Who will do that? Because a lot of stuff is happening in those heads of those young kids. And what I think I hit upon by accident in that class is I pushed a button on that language. I hit, by coincidence, on that language of interactivity. We do try, yeah? We do try hard. And we now even discuss gamification. You might have come across the term. Gamification. Let's use the best bits from games and put it on stuff that is a bit boring, so everything becomes fun. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's a font missing, because the second word should read in Greek letters. Because what happens with gamification is you can make it appear like it's a different language, but that's not translation. What we need to do, if we want to use this new language of interactivity, is to translate our learning materials. Not writing them in different tokens, 
but actually translated can do. If I showed a second word in Greek letters to a Greek person, he wouldn't know what was, it, was there, apart from recognizing the letters. If I would ask him to know Bajnini, he would say, oh, you mean play. And what we have been trying to do, even if we have experimented with games, is put a bit of game, put it on top of boring stuff, shelling it out to kids and say, look, game. And they would think, ah, chocolate. <laughs> and take a bite and think, ah, broccoli. <laughs> yeah, so what we create is chocolate covered broccoli. Walk into the schools with your kids, look at what they are playing, that's what it is. I'm sorry to say. There's a number of myths about games that's also hampering us from using the full potential of these new developments. For example, the difference between arousal and violence. Yeah? So red cheeks, excitement, fanatism, shouting, it all happens with kids playing games. It's also a characteristic of violence. So, oh, that's so, they become violent. No, they become aroused. You know the most violent game? It's a racing game from Nintendo, the people that make people smile. And it is a, it's called Mario Karts. Just play it multiplayer. Far more violence than any shooter game. Especially the blue hat you can throw to your opponents. <laughs> Anyone who plays it, you know the blue hat, right? So this is about arousal and violence. Another myth is the myth of fun. People sometimes say to me, you want to make everything fun? Education is not fun. You, you learn the hard way. It sometimes makes you cry. Okay, okay, okay. But I don't try to make it fun. I try to make it meaningful. It doesn't have to be fun. It can be hard. It can be, you can be frustrated. I, I don't care. But I don't want to make it fun. I want to make it meaningful. Games are not about fun. Look at kids that play games. They don't have fun. They shout. They call bad names. They get angry. And as a parent, you think, Go, do something else that you like doing. But if you say, why don't you stop? No, 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 no. <laughs> How dare you? So what's going on? Well, if they're playing a game, what they're trying to do is overcoming obstacles and be proud of that. That's what they're trying to do. So I always say the truth of fun in games is the sweetness of overcoming unnecessary obstacles. Why unnecessary? That's what we think. Our generation thinks, whoa, how unnecessary. Going out with a band in World of Warcraft, killing a dragon, why would you? And at the same time, within that World of Warcraft game, people have played away four and a half million years. We could have been to Mars and back and cured cancer if that amount of time would have been invested in those two subjects. Four and a half million years. It took from becoming a monkey, sitting here, is four and a half million years. <laughs> and this is just one game. There's a new game out called GTA V, the game we all hate because it puts kids in the perspective of a criminal, which sold out, where people stand in line at midnight to get a, uh, their hands on it, and with, which picked up a billion dollars in three days. Try that again. This is what's happening. And what are we doing with it? Nothing. So if we, if we teach students, we treat them as students. Why? A game never treats a player like a player. You become somebody else. A soldier. A doctor. A mayor, God, a racing driver. So what we do if we create applied games, for example, for learning, we give students a role, a different role. We give them a, re a responsibility. If they don't do stuff, then something goes wrong. And like we're standing here, this is, let's say, Lean Back Media. You are sitting, I'm doing the work. And I can't tell if you are now doing your shop re Shopping list, your grocery list, I can't tell. You're not responsible, you can walk away any time. There's no connection of responsibility whatsoever. I feel very responsible. Hi, Bali. Yeah, so responsibility is something which is completely overlooked in the classroom, on the side of the, of the students. Uh, so in a game, you give them responsibility. You also give them a clear sense of control. Yeah, what can I influence? How can I influence it? I want to do stuff that makes sense by me doing stuff. That's what games are about. I am the one doing the actions. And I'm facilitated by somebody else who was the designer. I need dynamic feedback on state. Because I need to be able to change my behavior based on that feedback to become more strategic. And please, let never ever try, uh, again call that trial and error. 
because gamers are highly strategic in making decisions. It's not fooling around in trial and error. It's very strategic decision making. And therefore, they need dynamic feedback on state. And that's what games are providing all the time. Give them a desirable aim. Learning about planning and control at the local community council level was not a desirable aim. Creating their own variant of the neighborhood that was about to be planned near Utrecht was. The actions they had to perform, the conversations they had to perform, were my original educational aims. They just didn't know. So a desirable aim can be made up to replace your pedagogical aim you have to do anyway. And what's also important is to celebrate a victory, to give people a clear sense of achievement. Make sure that you've actually won over something and be proud of it. You know what we do? We grade people and then remember all the mistakes and average that, and in the end we celebrate, yeah, well, you did sort of okay. You recovered from all the bad experiments you did. Well done. God almighty, who designed that one? Let's throw that one away. Yeah? So a clear sense of achievement is a really important one. And then, last but not least, games are about action verbs. You need to be able to do stuff. Games provide you with endless amounts of verbs, especially this new GTA one. <laughs> and most classrooms consist of three verbs. You look, you listen, you write. That was from the 19th century. The 20, 21st century is about action verbs. Let me control and do. And that is what we have to provide, that's what we have to design. Now, the point is, and the problem is, that if you look at examples other than games, this, for example, is live action role play, there we hit on the same language, but it doesn't involve technology. This is analog. But these kids live in a forest for a day and get all the ingredients, role, responsibility, action verbs, and they love it. It's run by volunteers, doesn't, doesn't get any support or subsidy. Uh, we've got 250 kids running around in the rain with a waiting list, because it's an expression of that language. It's a play language. So that is really crucial. And what is needed to get this into education is disruptive innovation. We need to leave our comfort zones. That's why it takes us so long. Because it's a different way of thinking and designing material. So the question is, who will disrupt? Will it be the publishers? No, I'm afraid not. They wait for the market. They don't want to take risk. They don't have that money, much money to be risking with. So they wait for teachers to ask for it. Teachers, well, let's face it, many of them don't speak this language fluently, are afraid of technology in the classroom. Let's take all the telephones and put them in the drawer of the earth, and you get the Mac at the end of the day. <laughs> a, a, a device that is a thousand times more powerful than the first computer I had. Yeah, let's take it away. So teachers, I don't think so. Then, um, it's funny to talk about interactivity and have a remote that is not really sort of controlling. Ah, politics. Politicians. No, they're traveling back in time. <laughs> Let's do more language. Let's do more mathematics. Drill and practice. Let's do more control. Let's keep them in the classroom. Yeah, more hours, more this, more that. Yeah, and it's our job then to fulfill that. Stay out of it, please. No, but they, that's, they are not going to disrupt innovatively, right? So then, the pupils? Um, I think they wish they could, but nobody asked them. So, no, I don't think so. So here we are, in education, and in a recent report to the European Commission, it says, opening up on education, that 90% of the future workforce will need um, ICT skills, 45% of the population will have it. Education is the last social sector to embrace new technologies, let alone learn to speak the language. How on earth dare we do that? I can't imagine. All it takes is a bit of courage, a bit of trust, a bit of seed money to start experimenting, building prototypes, validate them, and ro roll them out in the classrooms. Why don't we do that? Why not in education? I do it in healthcare. They are brave, they have trust, and a bit of seed money. I can't get into the course in education. So read that report. And you know why? For this generation, 
They, the future already happens. We should be ashamed. Thank you.